50 years ago, an academic called Gerald Scott went to the Isle of Skye and surveyed some beaches. In this paper, talked about sites requiring a degree of scrambling ability that precluded the everyday picnic or something along those lines. And I read this paper when I was a master's student and thought, oh, how cool would it be to go back there, see how it's changed and be able to go scrambling for, for my own research. I've sat on the idea since then and then um, I saw this funding opportunity come up from the Sea Changes Innovation Fund. And I thought, oh, it's 2022, that's 50 years ago from that paper. I wonder how it's changed over 50 years. And so myself and one of my colleagues, Melissa Sheila, came up with a project um, where we would go and look at the litter as it is today, use survey techniques that weren't available to Gerald Scott, such as the flying of drones and really accurate GPS logging. And then also talk to members of the community who have been on the island, not necessarily for 50 years, but over enough time to give us a picture of how litter on the island might have changed. We systematically go through with a team, look for the different plastics, and then I'm in charge of marking everything down. And then later on, we transpose all this information into the Excel spreadsheets. So many of our beaches, particularly right at the back of the beaches, it's these small chunks that we keep finding. You can see this bit's been cut here. We've got another cut here. And then what's cut off is what's washing up. And we've been pulling these nets out. We were at a site a few days ago where we pulled one of these out in almost pristine condition apart from the soil. And it came along with crisp packets that were dated to 1998, 1999 to preserve looking brand new because it's not been exposed to the elements to degrade. We quite often see these shorter lengths of rope in the mouths of cows. So we've seen that a couple of times. If they're in the grazing areas, we've got sheep just here. The sheep's foot is on a piece of plastic. We found it under a sheep's foot. Uh, it was transported up onto the very high beach by wind and wave and, uh, and was sort of working its way into the soil and a sheep that was grazing was standing on it. And we sort of looked over and it was a very improbable maroon color. Here it's mostly fishing gear, ropes, twines. I mean, I'm looking here now. Yeah, fishing net pieces, zero to 50 centimeters, fishing rope, fine twines, which basically are bits that have broken off old nets and things like that, string, cord, and actual pieces of plastic as being quite small. We've taken a one by one transect, so it's a quadrat and we are going through the seaweed and we're pulling out all the smaller plastics we can see. Dr. Tom Stanton has a wonderful eye and he sees all sorts of micros. So this is another piece of uh, fishing net, a much smaller strand, just like the other beach we were at. Um, it's either broken away from the net or it could have been cut out at sea and it's washed up. But this is the sort of thing we've seen at every single beach that we've been on. Um, one of the most common types of litter always this very distinctive green as well. Part of it is rethinking what we do with waste chains and waste management so we don't have bins tipping over in Malayag and coming across the water. And part of it is actually empowering people to collect some information so they can identify where things are coming from. We can talk to companies about extended producer responsibility and what the fate of their actual packaging is. There's a lot that can be done with alternative plastic type materials that do break down. So we don't need to make the wrapper of a, a candy bar out of something that's gonna last for two or 300 years. Actually, six or eight months might be fine. A lot of the issues that we were dealing with are around industrial design. We need to get industrial designers motivated, which means getting companies regulated. And in order to do that, we need data. And that's why we're here with the scientific team. But we also need community support and contribution. So the community science angle is really, really important for this project. The impact of this litter is quite varied. It depends on the type of the litter, the size of the litter, and where it is as well. So um, on the beach we're at today, we've already seen sheep grazing amongst the litter. Those sheep will almost certainly be exposed to small bits of plastic. We've been on our hands and knees picking up pieces of plastic smaller than a centimetre in size. So they could be ingesting it. Now, that size for a sheep is not really problematic, but bits of rope could be causing blockages of their stomachs. 
but it's certainly distressing for the animal as well. But then beyond the physical impact, there's also the chemical impact. So even those small bits of, of plastic have chemicals that might be leaching out of them from their production. But if they've come from the sea, there's all sorts of chemical pollution in the ocean that can be sticking to these small plastic particles. And then when it's inside an organism, that organism is exposed to those. Um, now, the health impacts of that are, are not well studied. They're certainly there. We know that, that they are problematic, but just how much and at what sort of scale we're still in the early days of trying to understand. So what we've got here is a piece of aquaculture gear. This has come from one of the salmon farms around the island, and we believe it's used for feeding. So they fire feeding pellets down these tubes into the salmon farms. These are obviously very problematic. They're washing up all over the island in different sizes. The one that I'm next to here is over 25 meters long. What you can't see is that these are really degraded on the outside. So they're washing ashore, and they're being gradually broken down through the action of the pebbles and the rocks that are on the beaches that they're moving across. And they're clearly breaking up into very, very small pieces at the surface. So this is introducing microplastic particles onto the beaches. These are then going to be washing out into the sea. But it's not just the outside. So on the inside of these tubes, they're also really abraded. And there's been some work looking at whether or not the way that the food is introduced to the salmon farms is potentially abrading the inside of these tubes meaning that the feeding process is also introducing microplastics out at sea. We are going out on the water to look at whether there is any microplastics or microfibers that are coming off of the litter that we find in the beaches or from the aquaculture that is used in these sea locks. Today we managed to get out on the paddle boards, which was great, and we took those surface samples, but we also took samples through depth. So we took samples at 5, 10, 15 and 20 metres. The reason that we're taking them at those depths is to have a look at how the water column is being mixed and how plastics and fibres might be moved through the system. But also we have um, a really big fish farm aquaculture going on in this lock. So we're interested to see if that is a particular source in comparison to some of our other sites that don't have such a direct proximity to one of those sorts of industries. We're collecting 10 litres of water and we filter those down and then we have a filter paper that collects all the plastics and fibres on it. And that's what we'll take back to the lab to analyse. This is an infrared microscope uh, and we can take a chemical signature, the chemical spectrum uh, from different materials uh, and see what types of chemicals they are. So we've been using this to look at plastic. Uh, so this is a plastic feeding tube that's been washed ashore and we've been looking at this as the reference sample, comparing it to microplastics that are found on the beach and in the sea uh, near where this washed up to see if chemically they are similar. Obviously this looks like a feeding tube, microplastics look like tiny little dots. Um, so down the microscope we can look and see if they look similar. This is what allows us to see if it's chemically similar or not. And we have a sample library, so we can run the spectrum through a sample library and check. Uh, and in this case, the lower spectrum here is, is the reference uh, spectrum. And uh, uh, from, from here, this is the known, the known reference up to the, the, the sample on the top, which is the, the microplastics. So we can run this, this bottom one here through a, and try and do it live for you. We can run it through, see which sample it is, and therefore it's come out with a a 91% match uh, to a particular polymer uh, from this polymer library. And that's, that gives us a really good idea that that is our, our sample of, of interest. As an area, we're very much known for the beauty of, of the land and the sea. In that regard, I think you, you, we were talking earlier that you had visited a beach the other day. One of the most beautiful places I've ever been to, Kamasunari, and you walk onto the beach and it's shocking, it's really shocking, the, the level of waste that has just ended up in this one place because of the tides, so, you know, it's not being washed back out again. We had a look at what was there, it was the worst we'd seen, it was just really, really dense, and we were combing through it. We found a load of lobster tags from North America, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, bilingual, I recognized them immediately, but we also found heaps of shotgun shells, 
So it actually has got brand PR written on it. Ah. So we've got a brand, wherever we can, we're taking the brands, try and work out provenance, but also if possible to look at these environmental social governance statements. Uh, but these shotgun cartridges we've been finding all over every single beach, in some cases numbering over 200 in one of our small 10 metre wide survey areas. And I was told by a local a story of, of some of these shotgun cartridges washing up on the Outer Hebrides, so Harrison Lewis, and then being reported to the local police who found out that they come from the USA. The local police apparently reported it to the Met. The Met took it to um, the FBI in the US who then tracked the, the batch numbers of these, these shotgun cartridges down to a Canadian store, so got in touch with the Mounties. And the Mounted Police um, Service went to the, the actual store and the store said, yeah, people go off. The, the coast of Nova Scotia shooting and that's how they'd washed up on the Outer Hebrides. It wasn't an illegal arms trade as was first thought. So these come these come a long way. They could be local, but a lot of them do come. So it's, no, it's Nova well. Scotians shooting things into the water. Exactly. Yeah, that sounds like home. <laughs> I take I take full responsibility. We did a little one meter by one meter quadrat in several different parts of the beach. And at the worst, we found 1,061 pieces of litter. And the way the wind and the tide work, it's all being driven in there. But we, we can see by the amount of North American rubbish that it's picking up something that's coming across in the Gulf Stream. But it's also getting a lot of fishing waste, likely from the Irish Sea. So I am looking at the lobster tags and fish tags that we found on beaches in Skye and I'm looking at the numbers and the letters on the tags and from that you can see whereabouts they came from. So this tag for example it says ME on it and that's the letters that show it's from Maine and then there's other numbers on there which can show you where on the coastline in Maine it came from. So this one is in zone C which will be down here. And then it's got the year on it as well. So we know this tag in particular came from 2005. So it's been out and about for a while. They're all from the same coastline, but there's ones from Maine, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. But then there's also ones from Canada. And so a lot of these ones here are from Canada. And you can tell by the difference in the numbers and the letters. And then this one is from Ireland. And there's more over here from the UK. Scotland and England. So Emily, how do Sky Beach Cleans record the litter that they find around Sky? And are there any challenges that they've had trying to do that? Yeah, with difficulty is the answer to the first question. We've been using the MCS protocols, but because the beaches here are so bad, they've allowed us to try and count what's in 10 meters. So we use their logging protocols, which are in line with OSPAR but there's so much litter on all of the beaches that we try and count it's really really difficult and you can easily spend like hours just like five of you on 10 meter stretch if you've got a lot of really really littered beaches is there any way that you could potentially speed things up so for example would flying drones over a beach to have a look at the litter be the sort of thing that people on the island would be potentially happy to try yeah i can definitely see it's got potential. There's loads of bits of sky that are completely inaccessible by land or you've got to take a quad bike and you have to access them by sea and we don't really know what litter is on those beaches so there could be huge bits of litter that are washed up that we don't know anything about and having a drone and understanding what's there instead of me zooming in on satellite images and just trying to see what might be likely would be really useful because then we can be more targeted when we actually have got a boat to come and clean things up. Okay I'll take enough now. Some of the beaches in Skye are pretty inaccessible and one of the things you can do with drones is that you can fly to those beaches and basically take photographs or take film and then you'll be able to understand using the data that we've gathered on the beaches how much litter is actually kind of in there. If you've got imagery of a remote beach using the data we're gathering on all the other beaches we'll start to be able to get a picture of how much litter would be there say after a year or two years. What that will mean is we'll be able to inform strategy. So essentially, how many people do we need to go and send to clean that beach?
When we undertake a survey with the drone, we take a series of overlapping images with the camera on the drone pointing straight down. Those over overlapping images can be merged into a single image that we call an ortho mosaic. With that ortho mosaic, the scale is uniform across that image. So we call that photogrammetry, which is the process of taking measurements from images. It is actually quite easy for members of the public to use these drones. There are obviously lots of regulations that the CAA uh, controls airspace. But if you're flying a drone under 250 grams, it's much easier to be flying that drone. So without too much training, it's, it's possible for members of the public to pick it up pretty quickly. The work that the residents are doing in the Isle of Skye is absolutely fantastic. There are a few key groups. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. We've surveyed eight beaches. Can you tell us a little bit about how having people, teams of scientists coming in and surveying the island can help you and how it fits with what you're doing? Yeah, it's so important to have research and have hard data um, because it's really difficult to collect that. I've been trying really hard to collect MCS data and it's a really difficult way to do things. The other thing that's really important is that locals' voices need to be heard. People here really, really care about this, and the people on this island aren't the people that are putting this litter on our beaches. It's, that is not where it's coming from. So it's really important to have you all come in, understand what's going on, have a complete outside perspective, and be able to um, represent Sky in its best light and really stand up for everyone's voices here that have been shouting into the void for a long time about this problem. The bin you're standing next to, People have been mistaking it for, for a beachside yes. bin. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about it? So, looking at the top of this, it seems like it's come from right across the water. So it's probably about 10 miles, but it says Loch Aber, so actually it's probably further than that. It's been maybe about 30 or 40 miles over the water um, and has washed up. And people have found it, stood it up, and decided that rather than taking their rubbish home or leaving it, they've been putting it in here and hopefully today we'll be taking that away with us. the Armadale Estate and the other one we're going to take to Sky Beach Kings and the small bags we'll take to Sky Beach Kings as well they'll recycle whatever they can particularly the nets but unfortunately most of it's going to have to go to landfill whilst we were there we were surveying nine beaches and across those beaches, we have logged 13,909 pieces of litter. And we reckon that we've, we've come away having cleared somewhere between one and a half and two tonnes of litter. We're also going to be hopefully placing our findings into bigger policies and bigger pieces of legislation. So, for example, the deposit return scheme for bottles. At the moment, it's really got stuck in the mud. The nature of what's being proposed is very plastic focused. We're absolutely advocating for an all-in deposit return scheme and the data that we've collected from Sky, when we put that into the context of some of the other work that we've been doing across mainland UK, really shows that we can't just focus on plastics. There's lots of other materials out there and we need to be bringing this in sooner rather than later. Um, the powers that be need to stop twiddling their thumbs and, and get on with it. So we really want to be able to use this data to call for faster action. We're not going to change the world on our own, but we're hopefully going to be part of the picture. What I want people to take home from this work is that we're all connected to these distant remote environments a lot more than we perhaps might realise. Those connections can be really indirect. You might not see the types of litter that we're finding on these beaches in the supermarkets, but they're still linked to a lot of the things that you can buy. Fish, for example, we're seeing so many nets, so much aquaculture gear. We want to help equip people with the knowledge to make informed consumer choices with the environment in mind. 50 years ago, Gerald Scott was telling us that if we don't change our behaviours, our beaches are going to be overrun with, with litter. And of course, that's exactly what happened. We weren't listening to what the academics and the scientists were 
telling us 50 years ago and we're still not listening to enough of the science. We need to, to do a lot more than we are doing. And I think one of the things that this project has shown is that we can't just listen to the science, we also need to listen to the people who are living with the problems that have been foreshadowed for so long.